There's not a reason why, there's but to do or die, is a chilling line from British poet Alfred Lloyd Tennyson describing the loyalty and duty to which 670 casualties of the British Light Brigade carried out their orders during the Battle of Balaclava. But why were these light cavalry troops charging down Russian artillery equipped only with sabres and lances? Therein lies a tale of tragic military bravado and bravery, as well as a harsh lesson about the necessity of a strict command structure. In this week's special area slip-ups, we investigate the causes and consequences of the charge of the Light Brigade. October 25th, 1854. British and Turkish forces along with their French allies clash against Russian troops attempting to seize the port city of Balaclava on the Crimean Peninsula during the Crimean War. It's a desperate struggle with high casualties on both sides and the first war in human history that we actually have official photographs of. Whilst the British and French forces had managed to hold off the main Russian attack, their Ottoman allies had been less successful, losing some key redoubts or forts on the reverse side of the Causeway Heights. In their retreat, the Ottoman forces had left behind some of their artillery pieces, which the Russians were now attempting to move back to their lines so they could use them as their own artillery. On site that day were the heavy and light brigades of the British cavalry. The light cavalry, lightly armed with swords, lances and fast horses, consisted of the 4th and 13th light dragoons, 17th lancers and 8th and 11th hussars. The heavy cavalry were armoured with metal helmets, breastplates and proper thick cavalry swords. This brigade was formed of the 4th Royal Irish Dragoon Guards, the 5th Dragoon Guards, the 6th Inniskilling Dragoons and the Scots Greys. The light cavalry was normally used to pursue and reconnaissance enemy forces, whilst their heavier counterparts formed an elite shock force that often spearheaded attacks and breakthroughs. It's at this point that we must pause for a moment and turn to this somewhat confusing but incredibly helpful hierarchy illustration that explores the makeup of the British command structure which operated during the battle. The entire British force, not only at Balaclava but also Crimea, was under the command of Field Marshal Fitzroy Somerset, known as Lord Raglan. Underneath him was Lieutenant General George Bingham, the 3rd Earl of Lucan. Bingham was overall commander of the British cavalry for the Crimean theatre. Then under Bingham were two separate commanders for the Light and Heavy Brigades. The Light Brigade was under the command of Major General James Brudenell, the 7th Earl of Cardigan, whilst the Heavy Brigade was under Major General James York Scarlet. In theory, Raglan should have simply told Bingham to tell Brudenell to launch an attack on the Causeway Heights, but in reality the process was far more confusing. Lord Raglan himself did not actually draft the order for the light cavalry to charge and disorient the Russian gunners attempting to draw away the artillery pieces. Instead, he entrusted his quartermaster general, Brigadier Richard Airy, to write the order. Airy then gave the note to a member of his staff, Captain Louis Edward Nolan. Nolan then read out the order to Lucan instead of simply giving him the written note. The order is as follows. Lord Raglan wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front, follow the enemy, and try to prevent the enemy carrying away the guns. Troop horse artillery may accompany. French cavalry is on your left, immediate. Since Lucan could not actually see the guns in question from where he was, he asked Nolan to clarify what guns the order was referring to. Nolan then responded with a wide sweep of his hand in the wrong direction. Instead of pointing at disordered and withdrawing Russian troops on the causeway forts, he had actually pointed to another redoubt at the end of a valley between the Fedyukin Heights and the Causeway Heights. At that redoubt was the Russian commander himself, Pavel Liprandi, along with 20 battalions of infantry and 50 artillery pieces in well-defended positions. The Light Brigade then received this order and Brudenel led his force of 670 troopers into the valley. Covered on either side by Russian cannon and met at the end with Russian musket fire, the horses and men went down by the hundreds that day. Cold steel met hard flesh as exploding cannonballs and deadly musket fire killed 118 men and their horses. More were either captured or critically wounded. By day's end, only 195 men of the original force of the Light Cavalry were able to report back with horses at camp. 
all sides that day, from the French to the Ottomans to the Russians themselves, marveled at how the British cavalry had essentially charged headlong into a suicidal mission that they knew would be impossible to win. The mission was so suicidal, and the valley itself was so infamous, that Lord Tennyson himself would later nickname it Death Valley in his signature poem. Though the charge of the Light Brigade had ended in disaster, their actions had immortalized them in the pantheons of both military and literary legends. Alfred Lord Tennyson's famous poem commemorating their courage and valor in the face of overwhelming odds is one of the most cited phrases from that time period. So what actually was learned from this tobacco? Well, for one thing, the British began reforming their army's command structure to be more direct. Instead of having separate commanders for the light and heavy cavalry, future structures would see both of them combined under one general, who was then directly underneath the overall commander at the time. Secondly, orders for any engagement or skirmish of any sort were to be delivered by note instead of verbally, to ensure that no ambiguity would result in the pointless deaths of hundreds ever again. Furthermore, these orders were to be delivered by the commanders themselves rather than their secretaries or brigadier generals. The charge of the Light Brigade, then, is a harsh reminder that learning from mistakes in war is not as simple as writing down a few new rules. There is always a heavy price to pay for the cost of learning in warfare. Next week, we move away from Europe to the former colonies of the USA as we cover a case of hysteria and confusion in a time of uncertainty. Join us next week as we explore the Wounded Knee Massacre. See you then, scholars.